हेलो फ्रेंड्स वंस अगेन आई वेलकम यू टू द जर्नी ऑफ सिक्स सिग्मा एंड नाउ वी आर मूविंग अहेड विद ए न्यू टॉपिक इन अवर टिपिकल डी एम ए आई सी डिफाइन मेजर एनालाइज इम्प्रूव एंड कंट्रोल साइकल सो बिफोर वी एक्चुअली से टॉक अबाउट टूडेज टॉपिक दैट इज डाटा कलेक्शन एंड समराइजेशन This topic is divided into two part, part one and part two, and lecture eighteen is uh, basically part one on data collection and summarization. So before we move on this, let us try to appreciate one very good quality quote. Quality is remembered long after the price is forgotten. So this is a very good quote. from the view point that quality is an experience so if you visit a restaurant if you visit hotel or if you go to bank then many a times fine they have charged for certain services we may forget but the quality is always remembered and in the form of experience it remains in our mind so then this leads to word to word mouth to word publicity and you become the agent of the organization and you market the services or the products so uh, before we move on the discussion on lecture 18 that is data summarization let us try to have a recap and let us appreciate where we are in our six sigma journey so if we quickly see then first we started with quality fundamentals and key concepts week 1 and week 2 were devoted on the discussion of various topics related to quality importance basics and fundamentals week 1 we have talked about brief overview of the course why this course is important and what you can expect from this course quality concepts and definitions so why quality is important and in the competitive world how organization can appreciate the importance of the quality and what are the indian organizations they are really striving for quality excellence then we have seen the detailed history of continuous improvement starting from inspection and then moving on to statistical quality control quality assurance and certification and then say lean six sigma and then lean six sigma we have also seen some of the critical concepts as a part of lecture 4 six sigma principles and focus areas part 1 and six sigma and focus areas part 2 as lecture 5 and we talked about what is the difference between 3 sigma and 6 sigma then what is dpmo how to calculate how to calculate the sigma level and judge the present level of quality and there are many other concepts like roll through pool yield fpy first pass yield and hidden factory and other concepts we have also seen in lecture 6 some 6 sigma applications where we have just studied couple of indian organizations which has implemented the six sigma and realized the various benefits in week 2 if you see in lecture 7 we talked about quality management basics and key concepts so you cannot really implement any continuous improvement program like six sigma unless you have a proper organizational culture and a system where such kind of initiatives can really flourish so we have seen and the quality management principles and tqm and then in detail in lecture 8 we have seen the fundamentals of tqm the views of various quality gurus their theories like crosby juran then ishikawa fegenbaum and many others lecture 9 was devoted on cost of quality and we appreciated that there is a cost of prevention there is a cost of appraisal internal failure cost external failure cost and unless 
you measure the quality in terms of cost it is not possible to convince the management for any quality initiative like six sigma then we had seen voice of customer this is the most important thing because you may be applying six sigma and you may think about the process improvement but if your process is not customer centric if your product is not customer centric then whatever effort you will put that will simply go west so it is important to understand customer and capture the voice and we talked about it subsequently we had seen as a part of lecture 11 quality function deployment so it's a cross uh, functional technique concurrent engineering and we try to see that quality can be built right at the design stage so we have seen house of quality and many other examples lecture 12 management and planning tools so we have seen affinity diagram tree diagram process decision programming charts and subsequently in lecture 13 management and planning tools part 2 we have seen few more uh, tools and approaches to analyze the situation and identify the root cause for which really the six sigma effort is required so these are in, has included matrix diagram prioritization matrices activity network diagram gain chart force field diagram benchmarking pace prioritization matrix and so on now in week 3 we have advanced in our journey and we basically dealt with the first phase of my DMAIC cycle and that is the defined phase. So, we have seen that what is the importance of Six Sigma project identification, selection and definition and what are the various CTX that could be critical to quality, critical to serviceability, critical to delivery and many others. Then lecture 15 we talk about project charter and monitoring, setting the objective, scope, responsibility matrix, expected deliverables and other things. Process characteristics and analysis we conducted in lecture 16 and we had seen couple of approaches like flow diagram, process flow matrix, process analysis tools, flow chart, value stream map, spaghetti diagram and circle diagram. Lecture 17 we devoted on SIPOC because I do not want to confine only to my organization. It is also important to see the implications of various phases in the value chain supply chain on each other and if we can try the various matrices synchronize them then really a value can be generated for the customer. So SIPOC is an approach which basically help you to understand, define, quantify the entire value chain, supply chain from supplier, your internal, then process, then your operations and customers. So this particular approach really helps to analyze the complete value chain. So we have seen uh, this uh, SIPOG in lecture 17. Now let us move ahead in our journey of DMAIC and we will now discuss the major phase of DMAIC that is the second phase and this phase we will cover in week 4 and week 5. So our plan for week 4 and week 5 is like this. Week 4 we will have lecture 18 on data collection and summarization basically this lecture part 1, lecture 19 part 2 of the same. Lecture 20 measurement system fundamentals, 21 measurement system analysis gauge R and R study, 22 fundamentals of statistics and 23 probability theory. Week 5 we will deal with some of the important topics like process capability analysis key concepts, process capability analysis measures and indices, process capability analysis some mini tab application and lecture 7 27 non normal process capability analysis so we are also trying to include in measure analyze phase wherever possible mini tab application so that 
you can conduct the analysis easily for more number of variables or factors and specifically as it gives you very good display of the graphs and charts and tables you only need to interpret them appropriately and industry people can easily make use of this researchers people engaged in the project can easily uh, make use of this uh, software and conduct the analysis so now uh, let us talk about uh, this lecture which is lecture 18 on data summarization so we will focus on variables and measurement scales data collection methods and population and sampling so measurement the word is very well known to all of us but what actually it means so measurement means assignment of numbers to the objects so there is a well saying that you cannot control if you cannot measure so anything if you have to control monitor you have to measure and for that say we have to assign the numbers sometimes the phenomena may be subjective but we try to capture it on a scale of 1 to 5 or 1 to 7 and then try to quantify the various issues so that measurement and subsequent analysis becomes possible foundation of scientific investigation as i said unless you have some quantified values you cannot further process it and you cannot apply the various statistical tools for gaining the deeper inferential insights and anything which gets measured gets controlled as i said and it is important that we can have a proper measurement system by which the phenomena can be appropriately captured so there are various ways or rather scales to measure the phenomena capture the phenomena and there are basically four scales and these types are ordered in that all later scales have all the properties of the earlier scales so if you move from nominal the four scales nominal ordinal interval and ratio then your nominal covers some portion when you go to ordinal it covers all the features of nominal in addition to that it covers something else so that way the various scales are developed and depending upon the need of measurement you make use of the various scales so we will see in detail so let us see nominal scale it is not really a scale because it does not scale objects along any dimensions please remember it is simply a labeling kind of approach it labels the objects so just see that if i take the example of gender then female and male if i take the example of color fine i may have gray color green color orange color blue color so here i am just trying to categorize i am just trying to label the various categories based on say some classification and if i do this it is called nominal scale the another scale which is little advanced compared to my nominal scale that is the ordinal scale here actually i am using the numbers to place objects in order so whatever phenomena i am studying i want to capture the order for example if you see the first box how is the attitude of staff towards customer so i have to have way means by which i can capture and here it is one means poor two means average three means above average four means good and five means excellent so ordinal scale basically places the numbers and then you are trying to measure a particular object or the phenomena then the another box you can see how do you feel today so fine i am giving you choices one very unhappy unhappy okay number three four happy and five very happy so likewise you can put the numbers and this number will help you to quantify that okay 
as on today what is the rating for a particular situation or the object. Then you have an interval scale which is widely used and you have seen. So, interval scale typically it is a scale on which equal interval between objects represent equal differences. The interval differences are meaningful there is some scientific basis and there is no true 0 please remember there is no true 0 we cannot defend ratio relationship. Okay, so, if I put b by a and then if I put c by b we cannot really defend the ratio relationship here there is no true 0, but through interval it defines the relationship. So, if we just see some examples to make it very clear then interval relationships are meaningful on scientific basis a 10 degree difference has the same meaning anywhere along the scale. So, you are using let us say thermometer and you have a scale in Fahrenheit or maybe centigrade and then 10 degree difference. Now, for example, difference between 20 and 30 degree is the same as between 70 and 80 degree. So, there is an increase in temperature of 10 degree, but we cannot say please remember there is a caution we cannot say that 60 degree is twice as hot as 30 degree there is no ratio relationship interval is fixed fine 40 to 50 10 degree increase 70 to 80 10 degree increase this is understood. But the moment I say that 60 degree is twice as hot as 30 degree this is not correct. So, ratio relationship is not valid and the reason mainly is there is no true 0 it is only an arbitrary 0. So, uh, this is the property of interval scale. Now, the last one if you see it is a ratio scale. So, this is the scale which has a true 0 you use this scale widely your stopwatch your scale measurement tap everywhere you are using basically the ratio scale. It has a true 0, 0 means it is a 0 distance, it is a 0 weight whatever you say 0 minute and this is a true 0. So, ratios are meaningful and physical scale of time length volume are ratio scales and we can say that 40 second is twice as long as if you compare it with the 20 second. This is not possible as I mentioned in the interval scale. Now, if we just see the summary and this will really help you and as I mentioned initially that as you advance in the scale from nominal to ordinal, ordinal to interval, interval to ratio each scale is able to cover the features of the previous scale in addition to some more features. So, if we see counts nominal yes, if we see mode median then this part is true for ordinal interval and ratio count is yes for all the case. If you see the order of value is known again this is true for ordinal interval ratio not for nominal then can quantify the difference between each value as we have seen not possible with ordinal, but interval and ratio it is possible can add and subtract value yes for interval and ratio can multiply and divide value interval ratio logic is not valid. So, here this is only possible in case of ratio scale. So, has true 0 obviously, it is a ratio scale. So, here please do not misunderstand that because ratio scale covers everything that is the best scale again I would say that it all depends upon the nature of phenomena the object you want to measure and the particular phenomena which is under investigation. So, um, I, I think uh, it would be very preliminary to say, but let us try to appreciate what is variable because we are now discussing the measure phase and subsequently we will see the analyze if we are not ap, uh, through and uh, thorough in our measure phase then analyze phase will not carry much value. 
that will follow just a simple principle GIGO garbage in garbage out. So, measurement phase is extremely important once you have defined the project and then once you have the measurement good measurement quality measurement you can really opt for the analyze phase. So, a variable is any characteristic number or quantity that can be measured or counted and variable is called a variable because the value may vary between data units in a population and may change over a period of time. Some examples age, sex, business income, expenses, country of birth, capital expenditure, class grades, eye color, vehicle type, many examples you can think of basically <laughs> are of variables. Broadly there are two categories of variables, one is numeric, other is categorical and when you say numeric again it could be of continuous and it could be of discrete. Discrete means a point value and continuous means there could be a decimal value and there is an interval within that you can measure the different values. Categorical that is ordinal and nominal. So, we have already seen the scale also. So, if you have to really analyze the data then your data could be seen into two categories continuous and discrete as I mentioned and if you are dealing with the continuous data then the appropriate scale would be interval and ratio scale. If you are dealing with the discrete data what is the gender male or female then for you it is the nominal or categorical data or ordinal data. You may have nominal or categorical multiple or attribute ordinal count or rating scale we are not going into this detail but just I am providing the classification that these are the various possibilities. Numeric values uh, basically that describes a measurable quantity as a number such as how many or how much or in other word we can say that numerical variables are quantitative variables you quantify it and you can do the further analysis. So, you have the broader classification as I mentioned you have continuous variable and this variable can take any value between a certain set of real number and discrete variable which can take a value based on count from a set of discrete whole values. So, you have two broad categories one is continuous other is discrete. You have categorical variables. So, basically have values that describe a quality or characteristic of a data unit such type what type it belongs to what category or which category. So, when you are dealing with such kind of phenomena basically you are trying to capture the categorical variable. Categorical variable they fall into mutually exclusive and collectively ex exhaustive definition and they are qualitative variables and represented by non numeric values. We can classify the categorical variables also and these are ordinal variables, nominal variables, ordinal variables take value that can be logically ordered or ranked we have seen and nominal variables take a value that is not able to be logically organized in a sequence, but it just helps you to classify. There are various data collection methods and let us try to appreciate the importance of couple of them. So, what is the importance of data collection method? See statistics we use extensively to analyze the phenomena and to draw conclusions which are more concrete based on inferential analysis. So, statistics is a branch of mathematics that deals with the collection analysis and interpretation of data and as I mentioned that analysis is only possible if you have appropriate good quality measurement of the object. So, data can be defined as groups of information that represent the qualitative or quantitative attribute of a variable or may be set of variables. We have different data collection methods 
सेंसस डेटा कलेक्शन सैंपल डेटा कलेक्शन एक्सपेरिमेंटल डेटा कलेक्शन एंड ऑब्जर्वेशनल डेटा कलेक्शन सो वेन यू गो फॉर सेंसस डेटा कलेक्शन यू आर ट्राइंग टू कलेक्ट ऑल द डेटा फ्रॉम ईच एंड एवरी मेंबर ऑफ द पॉपुलेशन सो वी मे से कपल ऑफ एग्जाम्पल दैट एज ऑफ ऑल द स्टूडेंट इन ए गिवन क्लास इंस्पेक्टिंग और टेस्टिंग एवरी आइटम प्रोड्यूस्ड इन ए मैन्युफैक्चरिंग लाइन and may be weighing all the deer in specific national park so this is your census related data second one which is very important that is the sample data collection so it's not possible for me to collect all the data of the population but i can draw a sample how to draw a sample we will see and based on my sample which is a representative of my population i can do the analysis there is an experimental data widely used in all engineering say branches so you conduct the experimentation tabulate your data in a specific format and based on this you try to derive certain conclusions you have observational data for example in lean we talk about gamba walk so here i will just walk through the company or plant and try to take the observation for example you are visiting a supermarket and just you are trying to observe how the things are arranged how the products are displayed or how the sales people they are behaving and then you are trying to collect some data on some scale or in a verbatim then this is your observational data collection now let us see sampling as i mentioned statistics basically do the inferential analysis based on the sample because i cannot deal with the population it is extremely cumbersome and costly and hence i try to take the sample and based on the analysis of the sample i try to make the inferences so the difference between population and sample is very simple population is whole or individuals you are interested in so suppose you want to study let us say the reasons behind hiv let us say fine you can say approach each and every person in the country and then try to analyze but that is not possible so you take the representative sample and based on that you are trying to draw certain conclusions so sample basically is a subset and the word which is very important it represents the population how it represents we will see so examples could be if you want to know the average weight of the resident of india that is the population then it is quite large a number and it's not possible for you so you may take some sample you may divide entire country into some zones and then you can take the sample or you can take the sample randomly for a particular region sampling method broadly you can classify into probabilistic sampling and non probabilistic sampling in probability sampling say sample has a known probability of being selected from the population in case of non probability sampling sample does not have known probability of being selected in convenience or voluntary response survey so i am i'm just trying to do the survey based on my convenience or based on my comfort and then i would only end up with those units those sample which are easily approachable to me and then it is not the non probability sampling in majority of the statistical analysis we mainly use probability sampling so let us try to see what are the widely used probabilistic sampling approaches so number 1 is simple random every item has has an equal chance it is the widely most widely used and i just try to draw the sample suppose you have produced let us say one batch of production during the first shift now there are 1000 bearings i will just try to draw the sample of desired quantity and then analyze the various features measure the various features may be outer diameter inner diameter inner diameter thickness surface finish and then i will try to conduct the quality analysis 
systematic here I will say sampling is done according to some defined norm example every 10th unit or every hour. So, instead of taking a sample from the batch what I will do I will inspect the production every 3 hour and then I will try to derive certain conclusions about the quality of the production. Stratified sampling here I divide the population into subgroups based on some common characteristic and select from each pallet or shift or machine etc. Cluster sampling here the population you divide into clusters that each represent entire population. So, suppose if you look at India then you have eastern zone, western zone, north zone and suppose you want to select the best players in for the cricket team then fine you may try to divide it into zone and then you conduct the investigation. There are certain issues uh, or difficulties in differentiating stratified and cluster sampling. So, uh, there is some trouble students they have. So, I will try to help you with example and uh, uh, say differentiation that how these two techniques are really different. So, when we say stratified versus cluster sampling, in stratified sampling you partition the population into groups. In cluster sampling you divide the population into clusters that is the groups here obtain a sample in case of stratified sampling from each group remember that is a stratum. In case of cluster sampling obtain a simple random sample of so many cluster. So, here it is about taking a sample from so many cluster from all possible cluster in stratified sampling collect data on each sample unit that was randomly sampled from each group. So, you have selected obtained a random sample from each group or stratum and then from that you are trying to collect a random sample. In case of cluster obtain data on every sampling unit in each of the randomly selected cluster. So, please understand the difference in cluster sampling I am selecting the cluster randomly and once the cluster is selected I obtain the data collect the data on every sampling unit every member in that particular cluster uh, which is randomly selected. I think this example will help you to make your idea better clear. Let us say stratified sampling and cluster sampling and here I want to select some of the government higher secondary schools from a particular district. So, let us say and obviously from that I want to select some students maybe in order to nominate them for uh, some competition or whatever. Now, population in case of stratified and cluster both is same that is all higher secondary students in the government school in the district. So, it is same for both group or strata here again it is same I am saying 15 different government higher secondary school in the district for cluster sampling again it is same. Now, the difference comes say obtain a simple random sample in case of stratified sampling 25 students from each of the 15 higher secondary schools. So, each school government higher secondary school I will take 25 students randomly. So, the total sample will be 15 into 25 that is 375. If you see the cluster sampling about obtain, obtaining a simple random sample what I will do I will select clusters randomly. So, I have 15 different government higher secondary schools which are the clusters or groups. I will select only 5 let us say randomly out of this 15 and then from this 5 every student in this 5 will be considered as a unit sampling unit for the measurement. So, that is the difference that once the cluster is selected randomly each unit will be measured in case of cluster sampling. There is a caution stratified sampling works best when a heterogeneous population is split into 
fairly homogeneous groups and it is important to note for cluster sampling that unlike the strata in stratified sampling, the clusters should be microcombs. So, basically some kind of uh, say units, some kind of clusters rather than subsections of the population representing some phenomena. So, that is the part and each cluster should be heterogeneous within it. So, just we can uh, finish with uh, some uh, advantages and disadvantages of the techniques sampling methods. So, simple random easy to conduct high probability of achieving a representative sample and meets assumption of many statistical procedure. So, this is widely used disadvantage identification of all members of the population can be difficult and contacting all members of the sample can be difficult. Systematic fine it is easy to conduct I know every third hour every fourth hour every 10 minute, but there could be a difficulty in getting the subgroups or some members of the population do not have an equal opportunity or equal chance of being included. Stratified and cluster we have seen in detail. So, stratified is more accurate sample same applies to cluster and similar way can be used for both proportional and non-proportional both stratified and cluster and representation of subgroup in the sample. If you see the disadvantage identification of all the members of the population can be difficult for stratified and in case of cluster representation is likely to become an issue. Now, let us finish this lecture with couple of think it question. This should help you to revise the content delivered in lecture 18 and couple of questions I am just floating for your introspection. What is the importance of data collection in Six Sigma processes? How do you categorize data? What are the different measurement scales for data collection? And finally, what are the different sampling methods and what are the relative advantages and disadvantages of each of the sampling methods. So, you can take the help of these references to go into detail of this topic and uh, see uh, some more examples. My conclusion about data collection and summarization is that it is important to recognize the nature of the data and collect them in an appropriate format to meet the ultimate objective of the analysis and scientific investigation. So, uh, thank you very much for your patience and interest in learning the concepts on data collection and summarization. We have part 2 on the same topic as lecture 19. We will discuss next time. Be with me.